Super. Thank you very much, and, and good morning, everyone. It's great to see so many uh, uh, old friends and, and hopefully new friends as well um, as I uh, talk a bit, as Eric said, about uh, our portfolio and, and where Caesar fits within it. Um, I'd like to point out, as Eric described, uh, our strategic planning process. One of the aspects of that included establishing a working group of our advisory council uh, specifically dedicated to genomic medicine and uh, helping us to plan um, you know, what directions we should take in that, and several members of that group are, are here today. You see them at the, at the table and in various places, so uh, delighted to have them here. Um, that working group was charged with advising us on research needed to evaluate and implement genomic medicine, uh, particularly reviewing current progress, identifying research gaps, and approaches for filling them, and that's one of the things that uh, uh, we have uh, uh, done, I think, quite effectively in uh, developing our programs, uh, publicizing key advances, uh, planning a series of meetings that I'll tell you about in a moment, uh, facilitating collaborations and exploring models for sort of long-term infrastructure building. Uh, this is a, uh, the first of, this was the first of a series of meetings that we held, this one in June of 2011 uh, in Chicago, where we invited uh, uh, whoever we knew uh, who was engaged in, in uh, genomic medicine implementation. Uh, about uh, 20 groups came, um, and uh, we, we then sort of developed a roadmap for how one might go about doing this uh, that was published in Genetics and Medicine. About six months later, we uh, had a group come together on forming collaborations. Uh, about six months after that, uh, brought together payers and, and other groups uh, in terms of uh, stakeholders as to what is needed um, to, uh, to justify uh, the, this implementation. Uh, in January of 2013, we had a, a whole meeting on physician education and spawned a group uh, that is still ongoing uh, to uh, bring professional societies together in, in educating physicians. Um, about six months after that, had a federal strategies meeting trying to uh, engage the various federal partners that we have in, uh, in moving forward with, uh, with genomic medicine. And I'm happy to say that, that some of those uh, initial um, uh, forays have borne fruit now in the Precision Medicine Initiative with uh, good collaborations going on with the FDA and the uh, Office of the National Coordinator. Uh, our sixth meeting in January of 2014 uh, had to do with uh, global implementation and identifying a number of very interesting models around the globe that, uh, that can be uh, uh, useful, I think, to us all. Uh, we, we got a bit exhausted at running these meetings every six months, so we, uh, we scaled back a bit to every nine months um, in October. October of 2014, held a meeting on genomic uh, clinical decision support, and then the meeting that I'll, I'll talk most about today uh, was just held in June, um, focusing on sort of an overview of all of our programs, how they fit together, and, uh, and what might be missing. Um, I like to look at our programs as sort of uh, uh, covering a spectrum of uh, intensity versus depth. So if you consider the depth of, of patient characterization increasing as one goes down the, uh, the slide here and the breadth uh, increasing as one goes off to the right, um, we have sort of an arrow that with uh, programs that, are, that have an individual patient focus, the Undiagnosed Diseases Network is probably uh, uh, the most in this uh, realm, uh, which focuses on, on a, a small number of individual patients uh, who are brought in for an evaluation that lasts a week, uh, something that we can't do in any of our other programs, but really very highly focused. Um, all of those are following sort of the same um, uh, clinical protocol. We have other programs that are uh, not quite so intense, but still fairly intense in, in patient evaluation insight. Uh, the newborn sequencing uh, program actually follows four different modules and uh, models uh, and protocols, and there are investigators from that group here. Um, Caesar, as you, as you well know, also is looking at a number of different uh, models, and you'll hear more about CSER in a moment. Um, and then we have, have programs that are more um, focused on evidence generation, though we're generating evidence from all of these, but more large-scale evidence generation and sort of system-wide impact, and that would include our Emerge Medical Records and in, in, uh, Electronic Medical Records and Genomics uh, Consortium, and then the, the IGNITE uh, Consortium that is actually trying to bring um, uh, genomic medicine to uh, less well-resourced settings and see what, uh, what it takes to be able to do so. This is a, a list of them, sort of all kind of shown together. Um, I would note that the Undiagnosed Diseases Network actually is not funded by NHGRI. It's funded by our common fund, although there's been a, a strong um, uh, NHGRI contribution in the Undiagnosed Diseases Program, which was begun in our clinical center by Bill Gall and the Office of Rare Disease Research. Uh, but the UDN, uh, per se, is now funded by the common fund. Uh, but our other programs are, are listed here, um, CSER obviously being there. It's a fairly large. Uh, um, investment, $65 million over a four-year 
five-year period. Um, and uh, uh, that does include uh, substantial commitment from our, our colleagues at the National Cancer Institute, for which we are quite grateful. Um, but un until recently, uh, CSER was really the largest by far of our programs. Uh, Emerge was recently renewed and expanded con uh, considerably, so it's uh, 56 million now over the four-year period. But you can see the goals and the, uh, uh, the funding levels of the other programs. The return of results program, you'll hear a little bit more about. It, it ended in fiscal 13 and was a small uh, focus of the LC research uh, program, but uh, uh, integrated quite effectively with, um, with CSER. I wanted to talk a bit about the meeting that we held in June to kind of look at the, an overview of all of our programs, the, the objectives of this meeting, um, which, which we would hope could be built upon by this group rather than necessarily repeated, um, would be to, uh, were to review our genomic medicine portfolio, um, identify related programs of other NIH institutes and centers. Well, um, identify research needs in genomic medicine and enhance approaches to uh, capturing and disseminating best practices as well as assessing the impact of our programs. Um, we had six programs that we focused on. I've shown you five of them here. ClinGen is a uh, curation annotation database uh, effort um, that I haven't described in, in detail, but uh, many are familiar with it. And we also had 20 related programs, things that, uh, that we felt were important to be aware of as we tried to uh, look at what NHGRI was doing should be doing and, and might not be doing. We have a series of program summaries. Um, we ask each of, the, of those 26 programs to produce these uh, and to describe the, the website, the funded sites, the objectives, the funding period, et cetera. Uh, questions often come up as to you know, who's doing what in our various programs. And I would refer to you, since we do have um, uh, internet access, uh, if you Google uh, genomic medicine um, eight, uh, you, know, and you, you need to use the, uh, the, the Roman numeral here to get it to come up to, as the first hit, but at any rate, um, this will bring you to this page, um, and there's a, a link that you can click for program summaries for both the focus and related programs, and if you click that, you can get to them if you have any questions about, you know, what, what one program might be doing. We also asked each of the programs to identify what their objectives were. Um, most of these were taken almost directly from the, the initial uh, RFAs and, and the um, um, uh, funding applications, and so uh, they've evolved a bit over time. Um, but uh, you'll see that matrix also on the, uh, on the, the meeting website. Um, and uh, objectives that were common to four or more of our major programs are shown here. I realize this is a lot of text, and I think one of the things we can do is perhaps email um, these slides to you after I'm finished, uh, if that's, is that feasible to, to do? Yeah. Um, so I didn't want to send them in advance because I wanted you to listen to me rather than, than surfing the web page. but at any rate. Um, so objectives that were common across almost all of the programs included improving genomic diagnostic methods, integrating genomic data into patient care that really, as Eric described, are our fourth and, and fifth uh, realms of our strategic plan, uh, incorporate actionable variants into the electronic medical records and really integrate them uh, with that, uh, educate clinicians and patients, assess outcomes, uh, translate uh, implementation outside specialized centers, um, and define and share processes of implementation, assess actionability, uh, identify and address barriers, and promote interaction and collaboration. So, so those are things that all of our programs do. Then when it comes to things that are, are really, you know, more focused in, in individual programs, uh, obviously the UDN is, is facilitating research in undiagnosed diseases and Mendelian diseases, but Insight and CSER also do a, a good bit of that. Um, um, looking at LC research issues related to genomic sequencing, uh, these three programs heavily involved in that. The two pluses mean that it's a special emphasis of a program interpreting sequence data in a variety of contexts. Uh, those investigators felt that was uh, that was really um, um, quite an emphasis of Insight, also of CSER and Emerge. Um, but obviously, using genomic data in newborn care care is uh, uh, important or a focus of Insight. And you can see uh, other goals here. And, and CSER, uh, really a very broad ranging program, uh, similar to emerge that really covers a wide range of, uh, of these goals. We also asked them to identify barriers that were facing multiple programs. A lack of evidence base was one of the key ones, uh, need for common data elements and uh, a variety of other um, uh, things, limited usefulness and interpret uh, interoperability of, of um, uh, clinical decision support, need for cloud computing, uh, reimbursement policies and regulations. 
Uh, what follows are, is a list of, of a lot of recommendations that we tried to pull out and, and just identify those that are, are relevant to sequencing. I won't read through them all, but these numbers shown here are, are um, uh, actually a survey that was done by uh, Duke University, which was a partner with us in developing the, uh, the meeting, and those that had the, the highest or the lowest number, sorry, had received sort of the most votes as being important. And again, these will be um, uh, spread uh, sent out to you, but there were recommendations related to payers. There were a series of uh, uh, individual studies that we should consider uh, doing. Uh, adding a family history tool was one that, that actually was, was quite well received by a number of, of groups. Um, a series of recommendations in clinical care, and I'm out of time, um, so I won't go through them all. And then uh, expanding our reach and interactions um, in, uh, with clinical labs, patients, and basic scientists. Again, we'll send these around so that you have them available, because something we'd like to ask you to do is to consider these recommendations in your deliberations. Uh, we will email them to you now. Um, and consider the appropriate role for clinical sequencing in NHGRI's uh, genomic medicine programs, as Eric outlined. Uh, recognize, though, that NHGRI's primary emphasis is on genome-wide, sort of disease-wide efforts, but there are times when it's appropriate for us to, to use a, a specific disease as a paradigm. Uh, and I will uh, identify thanks there, uh, including all of you, and be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Are there questions for Terry? We have a few minutes. It's a quiet group today. Hopefully, everyone's just warming up. <laughs> I'd like to introduce. I, I have, oh, I have a question. quick question. Yeah. yeah. Um, could we get the list of the participants in the GM8, GM8 meeting? Yeah, they are on the on the website. We can see if we can email them to you. But okay. um, but it, yeah, if you go to the GM8 website in the meeting summary at the very end, they're they're listed there. Terrific. Thanks. Actually, before I introduce Carolyn, I, I wanted to reemphasize if people would ask a question, uh, press the mic before asking their questions or come up to the, um, the floor mics. We have two of them there. That would be great. And I have a note that the, um, the audio in the back is not quite loud enough to overcome. There's some vent noise back there. So if we could turn up the mic a little bit, that would be great. Okay, if there are no further questions, I'd like to introduce Carolyn Hutter, a program director in the Division of Genomic Medicine, who will be talking to us about the future opportunities for genome sequencing and beyond workshop from last July. Carolyn? 